Texas, the Lone Star State, where big isn't just an adjective, it's reality. Big things happen in Texas in these wide open spaces. But today we're at the big track with big cars and big tires, driven by powerful big engines. This thing is huge, and it's causing some big wide eyes as the IRL comes to Texas. The state's racing heroes are bigger than life, like the versatile Lloyd Ruby, or three-time Indy 500 champion Johnny Rutherford, or the grand champion, four-time Indy winner A.J. Foyt. Well, the boys are here. They're strapped in. They're ready to run. The ceremonies are already underway. And we are ready to go racing. Everything is now in its place. The Indy Boys are back in Texas. And we are at the Texas Motor Speedway. The eyes of Texas are focused on home state hero A.J. Foyt and his two drivers. For Billy Boat, the pressure of replacing Scott Sharp may only be exceeded by the need for a home state win. His seventh place finish at Indy proves he can drive. Now, is he ready to win? And talk about pressure, Davey Hamilton carries Foyt's legendary number 14. A.J. spotted Hamilton's talent in 1989 when he won the Copper Classic. A victory here, and the Boise resident will be adopted by the entire state of Texas. Davey Hamilton's going to start ninth, but Billy Boat's all the way back in the 21st grid position. The reason? Well, a different qualifying procedure. It included a mandatory pit stop. He did the first two laps fine, but he blew right through the pits. The joke ever since has been he hasn't stopped yet. Billy doesn't think it's funny, and he says, watch me as I move to the front. The newest member in John Menard, stable of stallions, is 33-year-old Michigan native Robbie Buell. After successfully collecting titles in Barber Saab and Indy Lights, he sits poised to prove he's ready to win in just his sophomore season at IndyCar competition. Talented teammate Tony Stewart flexed his muscle early in USAC sprints, midgets, and silver crown cars. But despite front row starts in this series, he has yet to get a trip to victory lane. Just like the late laps at Indy, misfortune rears its ugly head. Maybe tonight will be the night the monkey leaps from Team Menards back. At Indianapolis Motor Speedway, it was Team Treadway. Yeah, Lion Dyke and Goodyear that finished first and second. Tonight, it's Team Menard that starts first and second. Will Tony Stewart get his first win? But these cars are so even, it could be teammate Buell that battles him right down to the checkered flag. Team Treadway of the double-barreled shotgun staring straight at Team Menard. Scott Goodyear matched his 92 closest finish again this year and is now focused on the top rung of the Texas podium. And if you get past Goodyear, then you've got to get around Ari Leyendijk. Nerves of steel and the courage to match is the reason Ari is now a two-time Indianapolis 500 champion. Scott Goodyear's gonna start fifth. Ari Leyendijk, another victim of the qualifying procedure. He's all the way back in 11th. He says he expects Team Menard to do just like an Indian, set the early pace. He and Goodyear will hunt him down. The eyes of Texas are on the high banks and talented drivers of the Indy Racing League tonight at Texas Motor Speedway. For the last month and a half since they tested here, everyone's talked about one thing, and that being speed easily over 200 miles an hour in testing and when they came here to qualify there was concern they would run 225 that's why USAC decided to make a mandatory rear wing setting six degrees of rear wing the minimum to try to cut the speed down and also they added this big tall one inch wicker bill on the back that kept the speeds at 216 plus in qualifying but the good news is both Goodyear and Firestone thought the speeds would be 225. That's why the tires here tonight will be very conservative. We should not see tires wearing, but they just might burn them off. And you know, the key to all of that is the repeated use of the word tonight, because we're going to make history here in Texas at the Texas Motor Speedway because we're gonna run the Indy cars under the lights for the very first time in history. Now, there's a lot going on down below. You've already heard much of that, but the drivers themselves, Jan Picas, what are they thinking? Well, I think they're thinking two things, Paul, and they're opposing thoughts. First of all, 
well, wait a minute. I'm running almost as fast here as I ran at Indianapolis Motor Speedway, but this is a one and a half mile racetrack. I'm going to have to be conservative. Things are going to happen fast. But the opposing thought, well, wait a minute. With that downforce that Jerry Punch just talked about, the cars are planted. You can run them high. You can run them low. Maybe I should go for it. The question will be, how conservative am I? How much risk do I take? And you got a glimpse of that banking a little bit earlier. It starts out gradual, but then it goes high. Two different banks here. And that has them thinking as well. It does, Paul. They're running the 24-degree bank, the high bank for these particular cars. But you think, well, they'll pull high G-forces. Well, not really. The actual lateral G-force is what pushes on your shoulder about the same as Indianapolis Motor Speedway. But because of the banking, they get positive Gs. Just like being in an airplane, pulling back on the stick, trying to do a loop, it pushes you down into the cockpit. So when you go on these high banks, you have to kind of look not over the front of the car, but up and off to the side so you can make sure it's clear. So there is a lot going on. Many stories to follow as we're ready to go racing in Texas. So Speed World is ready for the Indy Racing League in the True Value 500 at the Texas Motor Speedway, just north of Fort Worth, Texas. A magnificent facility here. The cars are lined up on the pit road, and I'll tell you what, the stands are filling up. They expect over 100,000 here tonight if they do things big in Texas. They also have a big jam out on the roads of people trying to get in to this magnificent facility. And there on the right side of the pit area, you get an idea of those new lights. They're, it's a new style, vastly similar to that used at Charlotte Motor Speedway, but an upgrade of that because the sun is already going down here and we'll be racing under those lights very, very shortly. They're designed, of course, to diffuse the light in such a way that it does not affect the driver's vision in any way at all. The ceremonies that they have planned, and in fact, many have already gone Ladies by, gentlemen, they're planned to be spectacular. Four, six horses and riders from the Fort Worth area will present to us our race flags for the True Value 500, along with the flag of the great Lone Star State. from a trapeze below the helicopter and bringing in the green flag to join the rest of the flag display at the start finish line the green flag will be brought in and then delivered to the mascot here at Texas Motor Speedway Sparky yeah there's there's uh, not enough money in the world to do that there he is Sparky up on the starter stand ready to take the green flag and I'll tell you what, the crowd has loved the ceremonies thus far. They have been spectacular. Transfer of the flag. Sparky with his chaps on. The transfer of the flag now as we're ready to move up to the top of the starting stand and we are we're ready to do some racing here tonight look at that crowd too 26 cars and teams they sit anxiously waiting on the pit road and now for that most famous command Drivers sit anxiously in their cars as we await the command. And as you can imagine all of the pressure that bears down on them on this historic night. And at this point in time, look at, look at the steers on the front. 
of Giovanni's car, the stair <laughs> horns on there. Well, you talked about the pressure. They're trying to relieve some down there on the grid. But there's uh, so much that lies ahead in this 500 kilometer, 208 lap run. And there has been much said, much speculated about what may in fact happen here. As we already mentioned, the tremendous speeds that they have seen on these high banks. And of course, the whole idea of engine reliability, that was pretty much put to rest at the Indianapolis 500. And that front row, well, the Menard engines, the Auroras that they carry have been spectacular in their performance. So there's a good number of uh, good number of engines here that we expect can go the whole way. Now they're clearing the track, getting ready for the start of the command, a last minute communication check before they fire those engines into life. And, and then we'll be ready for that order and we'll be ready to go racing as Tony Stewart for Team Menards. Gentlemen, start your engines. Well, after a quick and final check of the circuit, we're ready to go here. The command to start the engines has been given, and each team raises a hand. One of the representative team members, that indicates to the race officials that we are in fact ready to run here at the Texas Motor Speedway. The sun begins to set over the main grandstand. And already a shadow lies across not only the front straightaway of this quad oval, but of the pit area as well. And very shortly they'll roll out. If you're taking a look at some of the onboard cameras, that of course is Robin Huell, who starts on the outside of the front row in this most unusual qualifying procedure. Kenny Breck, who of course was involved in that incident before the start at Indy. Scott Goodyear, a little further back in the field. Finished second. And then Roberto Guerrero. And Mark Dinsmore, a little further back in the field. And Eddie Cheever. So we've got some great onboard cameras for you. We've got a lot to look forward to on what should be a very exciting evening. It should be, Paul. And you know, this is the most nervous time for the drivers. Just prior to that, gentlemen, start your engines. Now the engine is running. Those nerves are somewhat being reduced as the engine fires up. Indications that the Indy 500 winner, Ari Leyendyke, might be having a problem, Marty. We're by his pit, and all of a sudden on the radio, we hear that he had a battery problem and that he could not get fired. We're heading down there right now to see if they've got it fixed. Now, as we take a look at the number five Sprint PCS car, Ari Leyendijk is there. There's certainly no uh, furious movement. Nope, and there the car begins to roll away. So it appears that all is well with Ari Leyendijk, the winner of the MD500. And over in the pit area, you get a glimpse at the top of your screen. There's the balloon festival that begins here. The colors of the Texas Motor Speedway now float up into the sky. Now they used, as we indicated, a most unusual qualifying procedure here. What they actually had was three laps, two of them flying laps, and then on the third lap, you came in for a pit stop, made a two-tire stop, and then rocketed out and across the line. It was an attempt to put a little more action into it. It certainly did that. And it was an attempt to get the pit crew involved even more. And it did that as well. And so we're going to show you the starting grid, but we'll show you their qualifying time, which includes the pit stop. But keep track of that other, the fast lap time. On the pole, it's Tony Stewart. His teammate, Robbie Buell, starts alongside. In row two, it's Kenny Breck. And Kenny, of course, tested here in April. He had a big crash. He's hoping to put that out of his mind as he starts today. And the 96 Indy 500 champion, Buddy Lazier. In row three, Scott Goodyear. And Greg Ray with a very nice run. The fourth row, Eddie Cheever. Who ran yesterday in the warm-up session a very high line. He thinks the high line will take him to the front. And the Phoenix winner, Jim Guthrie. He had engine problems in Indianapolis. He now has Menard Power. In row five, Idaho's Davey Hamilton and Colorado's Buzz Calkins. Ari Leyendyke is in row six. And the Brazilian Marco Greco on the outside. In the seventh row, Robbie Groff and Mark Dismore from Greenfield, Indiana. In row eight, Roberto Guerrero and Alfonso Giafoni of Sao Paulo, Brazil. 
in the ninth row, Vincenzo Suspiri of Monte Carlo. And he is a guy, unfortunately, that has to start this race with a used engine. Team Scandia did not have enough to go around. And from Dallas, Texas, Alan May in his first ever IndyCar start. Then Dr. Jack Miller and Sam Smith in the 11th row, Billy Boat and Eliseo Salazar. And further down, it's Johnny Unzer, who is replacing Mike Groff, who had an accident here, and Fermin Velez. And then in the last row, Tice Carlson and Alessandro Zampedri. Now, Zampedri, unfortunately, does have a new engine, but team owner Andy Evans says, do not take it over 9,500 RPM. So now as they maneuver down the long backstretch, which is still in the sunlight, and there's the view as they come into the fourth turn. Now there's a little dog leg at this point. You look through the different onboard cameras and get a real good idea of the course. Yeah, and that dog leg creates quite a challenge because it narrows down off of four. It does, but if you look to the left-hand side, right now Kenny Breck was on the black pavement that has been added since the Winston Cup cars ran here. They have a little more room. Of course, these cars are narrower than the stock cars. Shouldn't be too much of a problem. So as we're ready to take a look at the start of this race and they begin the pace lap, the Indy Racing League is ready to run. Its drivers set to go. And we'll be watching all the engines, the tires, and the chassis, and they'll be focusing on the championship at the end of the run. Now, one car had to come into the pits and make a change. Billy Boat is into the pits because we understand one of the balloons that we saw that were released got into the radiator, so they had to obviously take that out. He won't really have time to get back in his spot, Paul. Now, they're already aligned out on the backstretch going into three, into their rows of two, ready for a start. He's just now working his way up through turn two, but he can at least come toward this start on the fly as the field nicely aligned. The pace car rolls down into the pit area, and we're ready to run in Texas. Green flag, green flag. And as the green flag comes out, it's Stewart that jumps to the front. They feel their way around. Robbie Buell works up on the high line. And already they've gone back yellow because we got a big crash. Marco Over Greco. Turn one, yeah. Marco Greco was spinning. Looking for other cars, uh, suggested it was big. It looked a lot bigger than it actually was. But look at that smoke. That is probably engine related. The Scandia team has had all kinds of engine problems, and I think I may see some fluid at the back end. So Marco Greco may have blown an engine that soon. Let's take a look at it. He's the red car. Of course, there's many red cars. Let's see which one. There it is. There is the engine letting go at the worst possible time for a driver. Now the oil, see he tries to bring it down on the lower part of the bank, but now there's oil on the tires, and thankfully it does not look as though anyone else touched him. And that was something, I, you know, cars went everywhere, and you thought for a moment with all those tires lit up that we were going to see a number of cars come off the wall, but fortunately Marco Greco's the only one involved. He is one of the drivers who was really hoping for a better engine in that show, in fact was very concerned about it this morning. Jerry Punch? Well, you know, last night, Andy Evans took the seats out of his personal airplane and flew that plane to Chicago to pick up a brand new engine for Marco Greco from NAC. The engine was picked up at midnight by five guys who loaded it in the airplane, brought it back. They spent most of the day putting this engine in. And just now, Gilbert Lage, who is the team manager for this team for Marco, tells me the engine apparently just let go, didn't even make it a lap. And they are probably through for the night. And, you know, that really works out for this car, Billy Boat. That is a huge break for him because obviously he was trying to catch up to the field. Uh, he is not going to be able to resume his original position because we did have a green flag. So Billy Boat uh, motors around behind the remainder of the field now in single file after an incident that luckily involved only one car, Marco Greco, in turn one on the start. Tonight's coverage of the Indy Racing League at the True Value 500 is being brought to you by True Value. No matter what you need, help is just around the corner. By Oldsmobile and your authorized Aurora retailers. And by Pennzoil, formulated for today's stop-and-go driving. Stop. Go Pennzoil.
Well, we're still under caution at the Texas Motor Speedway after that first lap incident. And the reason, of course, was Marco Greco on the start of the race apparently had an engine let go. Yes, going into the first turn, a brand new engine, as we heard before. There you see the puff of smoke. Now, initially, here, he knows he has a problem. He tries to bring it down on the 8-degree bank, but then it starts to get loose, brings him up. Dismore goes around the outside. Greco just tries to get it off of the racetrack. He does so, and you can see the transition there actually lifted one of the wheels off the ground. Now, we've got another view of this, and this shows you the impact of such a thing on drivers behind. And listen to the radio. In front of you, smoke in front of you. Now, he heard from the spotter, but believe me, Roberto Guerrero's visor is going to look just about like that onboard camera. That is time to get rid of a tearaway. Oh, and look at this. A second Scandia car, Greco being one. This is Fermin Velez. They're pushing the car behind the wall. And it looks like another engine-related problem, but this is a Brayton engine. The other one we saw was an NAC. So Scandia, with two different builders, has two engines go in the first lap. Jerry Punch, what's up down there? Oh, we caught up with Fermin Velez. Fermin, early on, I mean, you had to pull it in and, and exit the race. What happened? Well, I was just following instructions from my team owner. They decided they decide to call me in. It seems that they have a, there is a problem with the car, and it was a little unsafe to continue. So I'm just, they made the call, so I really don't know. Uh, I just feel really, really bad for, for the old Navy team because we were running so well this morning, and the car was fantastic, and uh, I really don't know what happened, and now it's all over. So we're going to have to wait for the next one, I guess. The concern, was that over the engine? They were concerned about running, uh, putting miles on the engine? I suppose, but you better ask Andy Evans. He's the one that made a call, so. All right, Fermin Velez, who... To him yet, so. Okay, we'll check in with Andy. Fermin Velez, who finished 10th at Indianapolis, has a short night. Now two of the team Scandia's five cars are gone. Paul? Yeah, interesting set of answers from Fermin Velez as well. Well, we're still under the yellow, though eight laps are already into the record book. Only... The first corner is actually run under green after Marco Greco had an engine let go and brought out this yellow. And they're still trying to get it cleaned up over in turn one. Back at the Texas Motor Speedway, the True Value 500, we're getting ready to go back green after that incident involving Marco Greco on the very first lap. And they are lined up single file now behind the pace car. We'll take a look at the true value field summary down through position 15. That is the way they will go to the green flag as they cross the start finish stripe. It should be now one lap to the green flag. We've seen some interesting things too. Many of the Scandia cars, uh, most notably uh, Sospiri, has actually been in the pits twice and they've topped off his car and changed tires. That's one of those things where as long as you have the opportunity and you're not worried about track position, you go ahead and do that. We just were on board with Eddie Cheever prior to this one, Roberto Guerrero. There were still stickers on the tires. A lot of these cars were so conservative at the initial start, still stickers on the tires. Jerry, interesting tactic going down. Talk to Andy Evans. He said Fermin Velez was ill today, had the flu, was in the infield care center getting IVs. His engine in his car was a brand new, and they figured since the driver was ill and probably wouldn't be able to make it all the way, they took the engine out of Suspiri's car, which has 650 miles on it. It's the same engine Suspiri used in Indianapolis. It was a tired engine, and Andy said, I made the, the call to put the tired engine with the tired, ill driver. Figured neither one would make it all the way, and to put the fresh engine in Vincenzo Suspiri's car. So that's what happened for me. Velez decided to park and had to get out because the engine wasn't running well, and Suspiri has been on and off pit road twice to top it off. Let's check in with Marty Reed. Thanks, Doc. You know, Jan, to follow up on your tire situation, uh, we checked with the Firestone officials. They said the track temperature right now is 100 degrees, which is actually quite cool what we're used to. So another reason why these guys are having a hard time scuffing them up. And Marty, uh, it was in the last night practice these guys had, the actual track temperature got down to 84 degrees as we got later in the evening. So tire temperature will be a bigger problem as we go into darkness. And you're looking like stickers on Billy Boat's car there, despite the fact they've been out, what, 18, 19 laps just it, rolling around. It just shows you how conservative these guys are running. They know the kind of speeds. They have to be careful. And also the banking really doesn't scuff the tires because of those positive Gs. So with, uh, with all of the changes that have occurred, what with the yellow and the pit stops and everything, Billy Boat's actually 
moving forward. The crowd begins to anticipate the restart here. And we're ready to go again. Green, green, green. Tony Stewart gets a good jump on his teammate. Robbie Buell leads him across the line. That's Buddy Lazier coming across in third. And here we're going to find out, can they stay side by side through these corners? Looks like they can. That does the course of course the oil dry from the cleanup from the blowing engine. And look at this, Buddy Lazier takes over second from Robbie Buell. Wow, that shows the high line and the guy who is aggressive who takes that win. He can really go for it. Buddy Lazier was really on the pedal there. And look at this fight as Davey Hamilton drops in behind and almost runs into Jim Guthrie. Jim Guthrie with that Menard power we talked about at the opening of the show. Most guys will stay down around that yellow line. We see a few other guys trying the high line. And now Hamilton trying to work on Jim Guthrie. Down the back stretch, going into three. Now it gets the door shut on him. Guthrie gave him room, though. And now Guthrie might have lost some speed, and this may give Hamilton an initial opportunity. Through the dog leg and cross the start finish line. front of the field buddy lazier is now closing on the leader tony stewart wow look at buddy lazier go he's not worried about tire temperature maybe that's the key he was more aggressive on the start he has tire temperature earlier than anyone else and he's just jamming on stewart so the battle is at the front of the field is now with the speed up the lacks begin to pick off they've been running the past couple laps between 213 and 216 miles an hour. Fastest lap thus far has been Lazier at 216. See a lot of cars close. There's Guthrie again, and there's Blindike. He is the third car, red, white, and blue, in your picture. He's starting to make a move also. Guthrie, Hamilton, Leyendike all running right together. The battle is for eighth place. Leyendike's car does not look as happy in traffic. And like, problem for Dr. Jack Miller. Yep. As he pulls down, and we'll see if this is going to bring yellow out all the way around, it does. So we have our second caution of the day as uh, Jack Miller pulls down off the edge of the race course. And we had a, a terrific battle at the front there, though, as Buddy Lazier moved around Robbie Buell, the teammate to the race leader, and lined up right behind Tony Stewart. Stewart, of course, still trying to score his first victory in the IRL. He's led all but one race but has not yet been able to score the victory. We'll look as the rest of the field comes through. I think the Menard strategy is to not run too hard at the beginning of the race. Of course, that would be Robbie Buell and Tony Stewart. Obviously, for Ron Hemmelgarn, the owner for Buddy Lazier, they have different plans. Talking about that, John, about Menard running hard. Uh, about 4 o'clock today, Tony Stewart's uh, team manager, Larry Curry, opted for a gear change, figuring the, the pace wouldn't be but about 210 or 211. They wanted to be able to conserve fuel, figuring that they got a good uh, few number of caution laps, they could possibly make it on three fuel stops. And so that was one of the early thoughts that they made this afternoon, was possibly going to a lower gear or maybe a cruise gear in Tony Stewart's car, figuring the pace wouldn't be that strong, but we've seen very quickly that Buddy Lazier wants the pace to be faster, and Stewart is gonna run right now. Let's check in with Marty. Well, we've got the word from the crew. Jack Miller radioed in, he says, hey, it must be an electrical problem. The thing literally just shut off, and he's making his way down the pit lane now. You know, that's something that perhaps with a change of a couple of black boxes could uh, put him back into competition. Buddy Lazier blistered a lap off at 216 miles an hour. That's Zampadri into the pits. 216 is three miles an hour faster than anybody else in the field has turned thus far. That is amazing speed, and Zampedri here has uh, what appears to be a problem. They're going for the side pod of that machine, so this does not look routine. Frustrating time for the man who at the end of last year's Indianapolis 500 was seriously injured. Took a long time to come back after breaks in his feet and legs and made it back for this year's 500 that had a frustrating race. And let's hope those frustrations are not continuing here. And you know, that was the kind of repair where they didn't actually take the side pod off. They were able to fix something there. Oh, you know what? That is the area that they would change if it was possibly too hot or too cold, the radiator area. So possibly it was overheating. And thankfully, this yellow would give them a chance to fix that. And behind the pace car now, the field circulates under yellow. Jack Miller has been delivered to the pits at the end of the tow road. They are going to work on that car. What can they change? 
Well, they can change pretty much all that they need, but uh, they are not going for the part of the car that would normally be the electrics. Marty? Guys, I don't know exactly yet what they touched, but they reached in, hit one switch, refired him, and he's back underway. Jerry? Well, Jan Bikas, your speculation about Alessandro Zampedri is exactly right. Talked to Dick Simon, he said, we have an overheating problem with the oil. He had to come in, take the side pod, and pull a baffle off, pull a piece off to get some more air in to try to cool it down a little bit. Otherwise, it should be okay. It's not okay for Dr. Jack Miller, though. He's rolled to a stop now just beyond the pit exit and in a uh, perilous position. They were hoping to go green flag at the end of this lap. I don't imagine they can do that with Jack Miller sitting down where he is because he's in a very exposed position. In fact, blocking one of the exits for one of the safety crews. It looks like they are going to go green because he is on pit road. So uh, he is somewhat shielded by the wall. Let's see if Buddy Lazier is as fast this time. The green comes out. Buddy Lazier, but take a look at the move. Kenny Brent comes down inside along with Robbie Buell. They almost touch tires as they head off through turn two. Now they string out. Buddy Lazier there had a little bit of a problem getting his car up to speed. I don't know if his lower gears are what he wants, but certainly not the kind of pace he ran earlier. Kenny Breck, man, he was just flying. What a move on you. So at the front of the field, Stuart Lazier, Breck Fuel, and you look at the tire manufacturers with uh, that battle and the going on constantly. Look at this as they come three wide across. Whoa! Very close against Buck Hawkins. I'm not so sure they didn't touch there. And that was Alan May. He's a new driver, comes from the Formula 4 2000 series. Those cars aren't as wide. Here comes Dan Schmidt on the inside of Hawkins. And Schmidt grabs the spot away from Hawkins. Hawkins may be in trouble because now the rest of the field seems to be able to close up and get around him. Here comes the point car. That's Billy Boat. There's Afonso Giafone in the brightly colored car, also making moves, and sure enough, here comes Buddy Lazier up front. Now finally he gets the speed rolling. Maybe he's got only high-speed gears in that thing set up to run. Let's go back and take a look at that. Now watch the red car. Well, close but no cigar still. I'll tell you what, that'd get my attention. Yeah, that's one of those things where you see, you know, imminent contact, and you make a little weave with the steering wheel. Back at the race for the front, Buddy Lazier, that purple car, number 91, as he tries to chase down Tony Stewart, and he's getting that job done. Boy, he's handling the corners very well. Wow, he was really stuck there in turn three and four, and he got a great run on Stewart. Battle for third place comes by. The rest of the field now seems to string out. That's two blue green cars kind of on the move there, right together. The yellow and blue car, Sam Schmidt, behind him, Jim Guthrie. Those are teammates. Billy Boat takes advantage. So Boat said that he would move up, said that he was upset with the nature of the qualifying because of the incident that he suffered during qualifying, and he is very definitely carving his way up through this field. You know, this race should get better as the night goes on because the guys will be more comfortable running the high line and they'll get some rubber up there. Right now, there's some brave people trying it, but as more and more do, it'll be more comfortable for all the cars. And Billy Boat trying to make up for lost time coming up through the field. But he has a long, long way to go. We go back to the front of the field. Lazier seem to have gained much overall though from time to time especially in three and four he, he seems to, to gain some on Stewart but then Stewart's able to pull away through the dog leg across the stripe and definitely down the back stretch. It's almost as if he has more speed but he is now biding his time. He may have had radio communications from Hemelgarden saying okay now we know we have the speed just stay back there and let's see what the, the pace of this race dictates fairly even laps at the front both of them at 215 last time around Stewart at 215.9 look at this Davey Hamilton on the outside of Dismore Dismore the 28 car white and red Davey Hamilton with that legendary number 14 that belongs to A.J. Foyt and finally by the way Jack Miller they get him restarted again and get him back into the fight on board with Dismore let's see if he picks up any draft here you can hear the engine pick up revs down the straightaway. Ooh, he's getting high up here. It doesn't seem to slow him down. They say if you run higher, it actually kind of frees the car up. Whoa, look out for slower traffic. That's oh, Eddie Cheever. Cheever. What's Cheever? 
Weaver doing down there and running so slow? Whoa, what a pass. <laughs> Whoa, and a car in trouble in turn two. It looks like Dr. Jack looks Miller. Like Miller again. Could be Alan May, their teammates identically. And it looks like Schmidt got into the wall as a result of that as well. I wonder if that's a dropping of oil that got both those cars loose. And you're right, it is May. Very similar cars. But the 44 car, which was raced by Steve Kinzer in Indianapolis, now to this uh, local rookie, Alan May, who is actually looking pretty solid, except for that one near brush with Buzz Calkins. So here is what set this up as we go yellow on the 38th of 208 laps. Okay, this should develop in the, uh, oh, that was Alan May just losing it all on his own. Let's see what happened to Sam Schmidt. There's Sam. Oh, Sam gets down on the lower part on the eight degrees. And of course, when you don't have that banking, wow, a couple other cars getting very close to touching May. But unfortunately, Sam Schmidt just tried to get out of the way of May and got in the wall. Now it appears both drivers are all right after that, but I'll tell you what, that was very scary, especially as May came down off the bank. Okay, there is the spin and the contact, but right in through here, that is where the actual change in the banking takes place. That is what caught out uh, Sam Schmidt because there's just not as much grip down there. So we're back under yellow at the Texas Motor Speedway, 38 laps complete as they get the debris from the incident involving the 16 car and the 44 car off the track. We're back with the Indy Racing League at the Texas Motor Speedway just north of Fort Worth for the True Value 500. Cleanup continuing. Most of the teams have decided to bring their cars into the pits, top off fuel, obviously playing a fuel strategy. But the leaders, Stewart, Lazier, they have not yet decided to make that change, though Kenny Breck did come into the pits on the last lap around and top off fuel as well. So strategy now beginning to play. Now, I would think for both Stewart and Buddy Lazier, they have seen Kenny Breck behind them make that stop. Robbie Groff in right now, also getting his uh, service at the same time. We've seen a lot of wing changes at the front of the cars because as it gets cooler, as the, the sun goes away, the lights come up here, the cars will get loose. Alessandro Zampedri also came in, topped off. So now we wait to see what the game is that will be played by the leaders. They have run 45 laps without a stop. They've come right from the green flag to this point in the race. Everyone else decided that uh, somewhere in the low 40s was a good place to stop, top the fuel off, and they have done so. So we expect them to come back to the green any time now. Remember Marco Greco, that problem on the uh, very first turn of the very first lap? Scary thing for a race driver. Fortunately, Jerry Punch was able to catch up with him. Well, thanks, Paul. The Brazilian Marco Greco is the first to exit there. Marco, a short night. I know you have to be disappointed. Well, we are very disappointed. I mean, the team, we came here with uh, basically no engines. I was running all weekend with an engine that I run at the Indianapolis 500. So we run all race in Indianapolis. We run the practice also in Indianapolis, the carburetion day. We arrive here. I couldn't even practice too much. You know, I give only eight laps for a qualify. And then I had to wait until they get another engine. That engine, I don't know where it come from, but it's not the engine I'm supposed to get. I'm supposed to get the Brayton engine and say NAC in the engine. And I mean, not even one lap. This is really bad. My sponsor, I, I believe they are very disappointed. You know, side play, they are helping me, backing me up very much. But uh, I believe it's uh, too many cars on the team. And I mean, we cannot keep it up with that. And it's, it's a very, very difficult for us. We are trying to make your career grow try to make the points in the championship and it's really very very disappointed obviously a very distressed driver here Marco Greco Paul well and that distress uh, somewhat properly placed I would think uh, he's been very frustrated for some time uh, the team has a lot of equipment three, three, three. Cars, and they tend to get stretched a little thin we're ready to go green it's out and again Buddy Lazier did not get a very good Start. Some of the other guys were just weaving from side to side trying to pick up spots, but Buddy Lazier may not have the gear ratios he needs. He's pretty much been left behind on each one of these restarts. Now there's Mark Dispar working 
on Sospiri. You're on board Dismore. He was flying through the field, back at the front. Here comes Lazier, makes his bid as they cross the line, head down into one. Now, not going to go high there, but he's going to be set up perfectly for turn three. Buddy Lazier, obviously, once he gets that car spooled up, that thing is really flying. They're both on Firestone tires. They both have G-Force chassis. They both have Oldsmobile engines, so they should be pretty evenly matched. Buddy Lazier into the corner, takes a slightly lower line. Down through the dog leg. Only has one on the last lap. Doesn't look like he can duplicate that one. Got to correct one thing. Buddy Lazier has a Delara, so they, they don't have identical machines here. But obviously, they're performing very closely at the moment. Last lap around, 213 for both. They're running nearly identical speeds, as we can see. Battle at the front of the field. It is a battle for the lead. Is Robbie Buell, then Greg Gray with a tremendous run. Ari Leyendijk, Scott Goodyear, Vincenzo Sospiri, and Dismore. We saw that battle a moment ago. Take a look. Still not room to pass. And the lights on the track beginning to take effect. You can see them flashing off the beautiful paint jobs on these cars. And there is one bit of consistency in that uh, graphic that we had. Firestone right now, right at the top of the field. Oh, take a look at this as Dismore continues to battle with Sosperi. Sosperi, we now know, has the new engine. We ride on board with Dismore, the 3.8 there. That tells him when he has to come into the pits. When he sees that fuel number, he knows he has to head for pit road. And this is the battle for seventh place. to like the low line here. Take a look at this for a battle within the team. Davey Hamilton on the left of the screen. His teammate behind him. Here comes Alfonso Giovanni in the brightly painted car. He's making a move on both. Whoa, it's Giovanni. He's going to get pinched up to that wall. Stays in the spot, but has to scrub off the speed and drops well back. Kenny Brecks on pit road. Early in the lead of the field, but obviously now the problem is somewhat serious. Did the motor die? They go for the side pod. Kenny, what, what happened to the motor, do you know? We had a big bang, and they lost all the power. Uh-oh, not the greatest sign in the world at all. Big bang, loss of power, that's not what you want to hear. Robbie Buell out there running above Tice Carlson. Greg Ray coming up behind him. Greg Ray currently sitting in third, fourth place, battling for third with Buell. Greg Ray, who has a similar car to Tice Carlson. Of course, Greg Ray is from Dallas, so he's got a lot of fans here. And look at this, he's making a move. He's coming after Buell. Say what, Greg Ray has been flying through this field. He's definitely beginning to challenge now. At the moment, I think passing is still somewhat difficult, but as these guys get a little braver, they're going to start getting just a little bit higher each time off that yellow line, wearing in that upper groove, and then they'll start to get brave when it comes time to making those passes for position. Yeah, as the skies begin to darken here and the lights take over, first time they've ever seen this condition. There's Boat and Hamilton again. That continuing battle for 11th place. Hamilton in that uh, orange and white car, number 14, Billy Boat right behind him. West Coast tear of the midget ranks. Now brings him down, still looking for room on the inside of Hamilton. Of course, when you're racing with your teammate, you want to make sure that you're as clean as possible when you go to make a pass, because if anything goes wrong, especially when you drive for AJ, you don't want to put a foot wrong here and you have both cars get in trouble. Boy, Billy Boat is pressuring him hard, though. Join us in the booth. Another member of this team, Scott Sharp, who uh, still can't get the clearance totally on the uh, uh, on his medical, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But boy, you're you're watching a great bet. And what's going on here, though? Because has Lazier dropped back on us? 
the board to come around you. Now, now place car. on board with Guerrero now. Scott, what do you think of that, of that battle you're seeing with Davey and, and uh, Billy Boat? Well, certainly some close racing out there. I, I'm sure they're being a little bit careful. They don't want uh, AJ's wrath to get on them, that's for sure. But uh, Billy looks like he's got the Cazigo car working well. I think both of them are sort of trying to be pretty patient at this point in the race. And now the leader's having to contend with traffic. Dismore back in the pits again. You can also see they're getting a little braver on cutting the course. And there is Lazier. He was having trouble moments ago working around Alessandro Zampedri. That dropped him back almost three seconds behind the leader of the race, Tony Stewart. Here's Robbie Buell and Greg Ray as they still battle. And this fight is for third. Scott, I hope you can sit and spend some time with us. It's too bad we don't see you down in a race car, but if you can spend some time up here, there's a lot to talk about as we watch this battle. And in fact, as you watch all these guys, what do you think of this place? Well, it, it's tremendous. Uh, a first-class facility, and it's great to see these IRL cars oh, and the racing that's no. going on. All of a sudden, Ray pulls off the pace. He was in the middle of that fight. What do you think? Well, it's hard to say. Obviously, it is mechanical of some kind. It does not appear as though he's got the kind of power that he needs. Uh, we won't know until he gets down on pit road. We hope it's not an engine problem because that might have dropped something on the racetrack. But Greg Ray, I mean, he's got to be pleased with how fast he was running. But unfortunately, it looks like, well, we hope his day's not done. But certainly, he's off the lead by a big margin. Put on a spectacular run chasing Robbie Buell. Let's see if we can figure it out. Now just right in the middle of the corner, he just slows. Ari Leindyke goes to the high side and goes by him. Jerry, what's up? Well, down in the pits here, they're saying that there's nothing wrong. They're just going to come in and make their routine stop. I asked ask Thomas Knapp, who is the owner of Greg Ray, if there was a problem. So they finished fueling the car. And now they've stalled the cars. Leindyke is also on pit road. The Indy 500 winner, and now Greg Ray has stalled the car that's trying to get it refired. What a tough race for the young man from Plano, Texas. As Lion Duck is out, and now finally Greg Ray's car refires, and he is back down pit road. Now that would lend us to believe that Greg Ray ran out of fuel, because if it takes that long to get the car refired, generally they have to spin and spin and spin the engine to get the thing back to life. So they may have gone a little bit too far and not got the fuel economy they expected. Yeah, a long way, 61 laps, a very long way to go. Everyone else has, of course, made at least one stop, including the leader of the race, Tony Stewart. You see him there. And he's still being chased by Buddy Lazier, but running through traffic, Lazier has fallen almost three and a half seconds back. Robbie Buell still sits in third. But with Ari going to the pits, Scott Goodyear has now moved up and sits in fourth place with Sosiri now running in fifth at Texas. Oh, no. The lights are on. We look at the Pennzoil field summary. Tony Stewart out in front of this field, but reports now are that he's slowing down. There he is. He has not yet made a stop. We may have given you the impression that he had. He has not. Lazier came in a lap ago. Could Stewart be out of fuel? There comes his teammate, Robbie Buell, around him. Well, Robbie Buell's not going a whole lot faster. Of course, there is an 80-mile-per-hour speed limit, but, of course, we saw that they were very slow. Jerry Punch, what's going on? Well, apparently Stewart is out of fuel. They, I, I asked him, I said, is he out of fuel, out of fuel? They nodded their head up and down, and now the car rolled into a stop. It was not running. They will put all four tires on it. What a tough break. This is the kind of luck that Tony Stewart and Team Menard have had in 1997. Now he's off the jacks. They're going to try to get it refired. Fuel is down and away. They still have not refired Stewart's car. They try once, try again, and, and now he's the gear and pulls away. Guys, you want to see the problem with Kenny Breck's car? Jan, they don't know what caused this. This is the coil system, and it literally just blew. He's back out on the track, but he's several laps down. And Marty, what they have nowadays is they have one coil per cylinder. So they have eight of those. Obviously, he lost a couple of them. But remember, he said it was a big bang, and then he lost power. So thankfully, it was an electrical bang and not a mechanical one. Bike continues on the circuit. There's more Hamilton. Billy both they all run together there. Now, remember under our first caution, we saw all the Scandia cars come in. One of those was LSAO Salazar. So he has not made a pit stop under this green portion because he topped off. So he's shown right now as our leader. 
So this is the battle at the front of the field. There was the leader, Salazar. He turns down pit road. That would give the lead over to Davey Hamilton, Scott Sharp. Yeah, very impressive. Uh, I think AJ chose to pit a little earlier on the last yellow, and that's paying off for them right now. Apparently, they have both cars working great, and it's good to see both the Seco and the Power Team car up there. Now, how is that with AJ as we watch the Salazar stop? AJ really you would think he really knows how to play the tactics and the strategy. Oh, he does. He's a bit of a gambler, AJ is. If there's a, a chance he thinks he might be able to pay off later in the race, he's certainly willing to take it. And uh, he just has seen, has seen it all before, so he knows when to make what kind of calls. He's a good guy to have on the radio. Yeah, you see AJ Foyt there. He doesn't even have to think about it. The mind just clicks and he knows, let's do this. Marty? Guys, I was talking to AJ before the race. He says, how many tickets did you bring for guests? He says, I have 300 Texans here, and we've got to do good. But Davey Hamilton just radioed in. He says, the car is getting loose. Now, Marty, that is one of the things that everyone will expect here. As the temperatures go down, what happens is the tire temperatures don't stay up. And because the rear tires are wider than the front, that means you lose rear grip in the rear. Everybody's concerned about going loose. So during the pit stops, they'll take front wing out if they can. So A.J. Foyt cars running 1-2 here. But wait a minute. Take a look at this. As Jim Guthrie comes in here. Wow, Jim Guthrie's hooked up. And that would be, I believe, so Spiri in the old Navy car because Velez is out. So it does certainly look as though Hamilton must be big time loose because he's dropping through the field in a hurry. And we'll keep track on Billy Boat who might have a similar position. No, he's able to come around, uh, come around Davy Hamilton and continue pursuit. But boy, what a fast move by Guthrie, and he came out of nowhere. He was sitting way back in third. Oh, oh no, no! Not another oh. engine. Keep an eye on him. Big puff at the back of the car. Scott, what do you think? I don't know. It's never good to see that. Uh, the motor's been running flawlessly, and AJ and K-Tech have worked so well and straightened our motor problems out. I sure hope that's not the case for Billy right now. He still seems to be up to speed. Definite smoke at the back of the car. Let's look again as he goes to number one. Uh, here it was. Jan, use that expert's eye. See if you can figure anything. Well, it certainly looks like it. Well, I was going to say it looks like it comes out of the exhaust pipe, but not necessarily. There could have been a little oil that kind of got over on a header or something, but boy, that type of puff of smoke is a big concern. Again, Scott Sharp, teammate uh, on the A.J. Foyt team's in the booth and watching this, and, and you're just kind of staring off into space trying to run all the probabilities. Well, yeah, you never know what it, exactly it is. Obviously, the motor must still be running good because Billy's out there. Maybe it was a transmission problem. Maybe he had a problem shifting up or shifting down in the gears. So Jim Guthrie, who had that spectacular run at Phoenix, taking the win there, is leading this race as he works around Alessandro Zampedri. And remember, Sam Schmidt was involved in that accident earlier. How's he doing now? Well, Paul, we, we caught up with Sam back here behind you. Know, Sam, we've got to stop meeting because we met in the early laps at Indy a couple of weeks ago, and now here in Dallas, you were caught up in an accident. How did that happen? Well, it's, it's really disappointing because we were running so good. I mean, the car started out a little bit loose, and, and then it just got so neutral. It was beautiful. Last three laps were 212, and I just went into one, and I saw the smoke, and uh, the spotter set inside, and it was just totally smoky, so I just, just got it just below the yellow line. It just took off, lost control. It's really disappointing. The guys from Hope, everybody's here, but uh, we had a good run going. I mean, we were just riding it out. The car was burning. Whoa! And Jim Guthrie gets it in trouble, and the leader of the race as he comes across the line. I think a tire exploded, Paul. I think the right that rear right tire. right rear is a mess. I think the right rear tire just blew up. We can hear it here in the booth. It was a blowout. Uh, that is one of the scariest things that can happen to a driver. Thankfully, it happened on the front stretch. And thankfully, Jim is waving back to the pits. He appears to be okay. And the cockpit has its integrity. But, boy, look at the right rear. And that thing just let go with a big explosion. You don't hear that very often. And a lot of times that comes from a cut tire. There are the pieces of the tire that is leading into what they call the dog leg just before the start finish line. Maybe he hit some debris and boy, that thing let go. That, that's a scary moment. Well, as the safety crew is there with him, he's obviously all right, but uh, seemingly confused as what happened. Here it is, Jan. Watch this tire, which would be on the left of your screen, the left rear, there it is, it just explodes. My, oh my, you could not explode a tire in a better place. 
as far as I mean you never there's never a good place but if there's any place to do it do it in the dog leg to where the car is going to have minimal damage and yeah, fortunately there's a piece of straightaway here that gave him plenty of room and he kept the car fairly straight off the end of the dog leg and down toward turn one and I tell you that was a huge surprise for him I mean this is a place you would never expect the car you can just see that thing unravel we are situated in our broadcast position about seven stories above the track finish just the track surface just beyond the uh, start finish line and you can hear it through the glass up here when it oh, let yeah. go you can hear the boom so there is some debris on the track you saw at the uh, shock cover panel there from the front of the car on Jim Guthrie's machine the leader of the race has a tire let go it puts him up against the wall damage to the car obviously he is out of the run we do have cleanup underway and Billy Boat will pick up the lead of the race on this yellow flag. He'll be followed by Davey Hamilton, his teammate. A spectacular run for Billy Boat, who started back in 21st and has managed to move up to the front of the True Value 500 at the Texas Motor Speedway. Come in at the True Value 500, the IRL at Texas Motor Speedway. The leader is Billy Boat, who started well back in the field, has really put on a show. Coming up to the front, his teammate Davey Hamilton came in in third, and Robbie Groff, or came in in second, Robbie Groff being shown as third. But there's a change for the lead. Robbie Buell looks like he beats Boat out. So Robbie Buell has just got the lead of the race, and his teammate, Tony Stewart there drops into third. So Menard Pitwork, remember, they probably didn't have as much fuel to put in because they were in a slightly different sequence. Uh, boy, that paid off well for Menard. And you were you were asking several of the teams earlier about refueling times in the IRL. Yeah, and they can fuel these cars at about 10 seconds at the first stop, and then as they get to the last one, about 14 seconds for the fuel to get in, assuming that you need 35 gallons. Now, let's talk some more about tires. They came in and changed tires. Talking to a Goodyear engineer, he told me that the right rear tire here has the highest loading of any place they've ever run an IndyCar. 3,000 pounds of loading. So we're assuming that maybe some debris cut the tire for Jim Guthrie. We hope it wasn't because of the extreme loading. In the pits, all of the Goodyear Eagles ready to be strapped on the cars on an as-needed basis. As Carlson from Indianapolis, Indiana, Tice Carlson comes in gets a fresh change of rubber. Now the reason that car looks just like Jim Guthrie's is because he had a crash here in his black car and they have, see it's almost identical to this car coming in on the hook because it was a blueprint team car and Alfonso Giafone's blown up. He's on fire. Fire at the back of the car. Alfonso is safely out and he triggers the fire system on board trying to get that out before it does much more damage and climbs safely over the wall. What's the story on, on Jim Guthrie, Marty? Well, they're taking the car back, and we can tell you they have put Jim in the ambulance, and they're taking him to the medical center. But just before he climbed in, he looked over. He was talking to people. He was smiling, very coherent. Looks like it'll be a routine checkup, but you know the rules. He's got to go make the mandatory stop. Well, the good news was that we saw him walking and talking and arguing, so it, I suspect he's in good shape. Here it is again, Jan. Just watch on the left of your screen the right rear tire. I mean, that thing just completely comes apart. And again, there's no way that uh, we can tell at this stage whether he cut that tire or if it had anything to do with the load on the tire. But there's no question, for whatever reason, that thing came apart. And then under the yellow for this, we've had some action in the pits that created a lead change for us. And then Alfonso Giafone bought, brought the 17 car to a stop. And on fire, he climbed out safely. You can see him at the right of your screen there still watching the rescue crews as they try to get that fire shut down. And get the car safely out of the way. On board with Eddie Cheever as we're under yellow with 86 laps completed at the Texas Motor Speedway. And for the moment, it's Robbie Groff being shown in front. Mike Groff sitting in Methodist Hospital suffering those breaks sees this along with the rest of the Groff family, the leader of the race, car number 30, Robbie Groff. The Team loves the Alpha Lavelle car, comes into the pits as the leader. Picks it up on that last stop. 
Well, he came from 21st tonight at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. What a great run for Robbie, and he started 13th in this race, being shown as a leader. This morning, he told me he would love to have a good run because he knows that Mike is watching in Indianapolis, Indiana, at Bethlehem Hospital. Down and away, four tires, full of fuel, and heads back to turn one. And Paul, one of the things that we have to try and figure out here is that when we saw the Menard cars coming out, we saw them what we thought was picking up position. But what I failed to realize was that when they made their earlier stop, that they actually went a lap down because they had to pit under green. So they picked up what looked like position in the pit stop itself, but unfortunately they have not made up their lap. So both Buell and Stewart are back in 10th and 11th place, even though they show pretty far up on the front of the field as far as behind the pace car. Well, if we can take a look at the Firestone field summary, then we can see exactly how they set now with Buddy Lazier up from fourth to the lead, but Billy Boat is still the uh, spectacular run of this race, though Davey Hamilton has had a nice run as well, and there are your top 15 with the top six cars still on the leader lap, and Robbie Groff dropped down a bit, but remains on the leader lap, and of course will be pulled up fairly tight to the pace car as they're ready to go back green. Now, don't forget, it's not just tonight, it's the racing. Tomorrow, we've got a big day of racing for you. RPM Today kicks it off at noon, then NASCAR Today, and then CART on the grid here on the Deuce, and then they'll switch over to ABC for coverage of the Detroit Grand Prix from Belle Isle in Detroit, and then a wrap-up of the entire day's work back here on the Deuce with RPM Tonight at 8 o'clock. A lot of action both tonight and tomorrow. And it is covered right here on the Deuce. So at the Texas Motor Speedway, yellow light still flashes. We expect to go green shortly. Against the wall, cushioning the impact. But obviously uh, the car has uh, sustained some fairly serious damage. And they are positioned back behind the wall. I'm, I'm making the presumption that no one is planning in any way of trying to get this car back in the race after it had a tire let go on the right rear just before the start-finish line and unfortunately while Jim Guthrie was leading the race. Ron Hemmelgarn watches as his car driven by Buddy Lazier at the 96 Indy 500 champion. Green, 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 green. green. The field back under the green flag. Here we go again. 92 laps complete, 208 the scheduled distance. Now we're going to have to look back in the field to find Buddy. There he went. He just went through the screen. He's got a few left cars to work through. Now you see the bright car of Tony Stewart there, about fourth in your picture. And he and you are both down laps. They're going to have to absolutely go for it right now and try to get their lap back. The next car actually in contact is that blue and white Conceco car. And that, of course, is going to come tucked back behind Robbie Buell right now, so he's got quite a distance to make up, but he's done it before. He can do it again. He crossed the line only three and a half seconds behind the leader, Buddy Lazier. Then Davey Hamilton will sit in third. Buzz Calkins is now fourth, and Robbie Groff is fifth. Boy, Ari Leindyke made a big-time move there. I believe it was on So Spiri. Ari Leindyke really on the pedal there, and it shows the higher groove did work. Lazier now high groove in turn one. Not too many people have run this. That white number 30 car just ahead of them, two cars ahead. That's Groff, and he is the last car on the lead lap. That might be, that's Scott Goodyear. That's the two teammates just right together now. There. Way cars. So now two ahead to Groff. Salazar is running pretty good. These Menard guys are having a really tough time getting by the, the white, green, and yellow car of Salazar. Hamilton working with Breck, trying to close on both. Boy, things happen fast here, Paul. <laughs> Buell comes out around Salazar as second place Boat tries to work through this traffic. Salazar, Stewart, Cheever, they are all at the same time battling for position. And the position is eight. And now we have a close battle for second place, and it's the teammates right behind Boat. Hamilton is starting to close in on his teammate. Take a look down here now. There is Buddy Lazier. As he again is closing on traffic, trying to catch up and put even more cars down a lap. 
He's trying to chase down Suspiri. He's done that. Well, almost down. So Sperry still holding off the leader of the race. So Sperry in fifth place. Buddy right now knows he'll be told on the radio he has a 6.4 advantage to the next car, so he's not going to push it too hard in traffic unless he feels comfortable. Wow, look at the change there. Look how many more teams we have up in the top now, with the exception, of course, of our leader, Luzier. Things change so fast here on this one-and-a-half-mile track. Luzier works so sparing, and this time puts him down. how well it's stuck in the early going. Both Boat and Hamilton trying to catch up, and they're falling further and further behind as they have to work through traffic. They're now seven seconds back. We're looking for Billy Boat to come through in his blue and white car. There he goes. And he's put some distance now on his teammate Hamilton. I think Hamilton got stuck in a little bit of traffic there. Obviously, as we're now starting to run quite a few laps under green, we're starting to get kind of a rhythm going on this race. We'll find out who can work the traffic well and who can't. Now we look for Davey Hamilton. Next in line, there he is, the 14 car. So the two Foyt cars run second and third. And Robbie Groff is fourth in the 30 car. We'll look back for him. White number 30. He's definitely there. That's an impressive run for Robbie Groff. Staying on the lead lap. Uh, a lot of tough decisions to be made down there on the pit road. And, and they've made the right so far. Not only a deserving driver, but a deserving team. They've tried for so long. Buzz Calkins' car has been pulled out of competition behind the wall. No indication as what his problem might have been yet. So 105 laps to go. Buddy Lazier, the Indianapolis champion from a year ago, is the leader. But A.J. Foyt's team can definitely work on it. And the fans here at Texas Motor Speedway are loving it. at better than 100,000. Buddy Lazier leads. Right behind him is Tony Stewart. And Tony is trying to grab a lap back. He just rocketed in between the two Team Treadway cars, Goodyear and Leyendijk, and now is set up to try to get back on the lead lap. And if he can do that, of course, he can see another caution period. He's definitely going to be in attack position. But Buddy Lazier is very conscious of his presence. Not sure that he'll try and hold it, but I would think it might be a good idea. Well, if it was me, I would want to make sure that Tony Stewart didn't get by me. I would do everything that I could. Tony Stewart does run in fifth position, but like you said, Paul, if he can get by Buddy Lazier and then we have any kind of caution, he will have the opportunity then to come around the back and be on the lead lap. Traffic wow. ahead for the leader. Roberto Guerrero is the traffic as they work up around him. Lion bike is the car they went by. You're listening to Roberto Spotter. Coming underneath you. Now he's going on the outside. He's on the outside. And Lion Dyke's going to go to the inside. He didn't tell him about Lion Dyke. He only told him about Stewart. Roberto Guerrero, man, he had a big moment there. Oh, and they're all bottled up behind Roberto there for a second. Lion Dyke finally moves to the inside. Scott Goodyear sitting up behind him and comes alongside. Scott Goodyear now taking the lower groove. Roberto has been running pretty high most of the race, giving people room underneath. So Cleary in the battle as well there with Dismore and Scott Goodyear. Yeah, Mark Dismore begins to work. And now here comes Stewart. He gets fouled up a bit behind Alessandro Zampedri, gets around him, continues his pursuit of the leader to try to get his lap back. But Buddy is making his job difficult. Buddy is really working hard on traffic and he knows how important it is to try and get Stewart or keep him a lap down. The leader clear of all contests for the moment. Well, Formula 2000 Oval Crown champion Alan May took a wild ride earlier in the evening. Alan, uh, what happened? 
That was one of those things. Um, the young Chevrolet ARS team did a great job getting me a car that was working perfectly. And uh, Owen had it set up with a little bit of a push in it, and that's the way it had been the, the, the whole race to that point. And then going into turn one that last time, it just got real loose in a hurry. I'm not sure if, uh, you know, maybe we cut a right rear tire down or something, or, or I just turned in a bit too hard. I'm not sure what happened, but it got loose in a hurry. Well, that's Alan May. Let's check in with Marty Greenwood, who has a driver who's had even a wilder ride. Right, Marty? You better believe that Jim Guthrie has uh, gotten out of the uh, medical care center in one, you are okay, and two, what happened to that right rear tire? Yeah, I'm fine. You know, that jacuzzi car was flying. We really had a good run going. I guess we must have cut a tire. You know, Firestone's given us some awesome tires just last week. They were great. Unfortunately, I think we just cut one, and it just came apart. Sorry to see you out. Eddie Cheever, Robbie Buell, they're battling for eighth place. Buell just grabbed it away. And then just ahead, of course, we've been watching Stewart with Mark Dismore chasing him as he tries to get his lap back from the leader of the race, Buddy Lazier. Billy Boat, who sits in second, is about 12 seconds behind the leader as you ride with Eddie Cheever, who currently sits 12. idea of the lights when you look out the back of Cheever's car. Mark Dismore suddenly off the pace. Dismore coming out of a battle for sixth place. Off the pace sounds very much like an engine. Looks like he's going to make it all the way around into the pits. There was a hesitancy whether or not they were going to go yellow. Here comes Stewart on the charge. Stewart goes down low on Lazier. Stewart comes back onto the lead lap. And Buddy Lazier gave him room there. Buddy decided it was not worth racing Tony Stewart that hard. He saw that Tony Stewart had a run on him. That was good sportsmanship by Lazier. He gave him plenty of racing room on the bottom of the racetrack. Go past the halfway point now. 116 laps complete of the 208 lap schedule distance with Buddy Lazier still the leader. Billy Boat still in second. Stewart on the move. 500 continuing to focus on Tony Stewart and Buddy Lazier. Buddy Lazier, the 91 car, the Delta Fawcett car on the right side of your screen is currently the leader, but it looks like he is heading down on the pit road. Vincenzo Sosperi made a stop just a few moments ago, as did Ari Leyendijk. So Buddy Lazier now brings it off of four, slows it down. That'll give the lead of the race over to Billy Boat. And Lazier comes out of that battle with Tony Stewart. Stewart was able to get around him a few moments ago, and that put him back on the lead lap. So should there be a caution, he'll be in great shape too, Marty. Well, guys, they were trying to make this on two more stops. Now, by my calculations, we're at lap 120. That's just past the halfway. That means average of 42 laps. That's 84. That's going to be very, very close. It's a 208 lap race. They need some more yellow. And Marty, we saw a big change on the front wing there. That means that his car might be getting loose like we expected Roberto now on pit road. And take a look at the flames as he flips that throttle coming out there. Here was that move. Take a look at this. Buddy Lazier right down through the dirt. And Buddy Lazier knew he was coming into the pits at the end of this lap, but he really was getting aggressive on trying to get by Tony Stewart. So Buddy Lazier makes his stop. It's clean. He's in and out. And Billy Boat picks up the lead of the race, driving for the great A.J. Foyt. And the one thing that Buddy Lazier is hoping right now, ooh, that was a close moment there between Cheever and Boat. But what Buddy Lazier is hoping for now over the next few laps is there's no caution before Billy Boat has a chance to pit because that would be a huge advantage for Foyt and for Billy Boat. And one of the big surprises was that Buzz Calkins just suddenly pulled off the course. What happened there? Well, Paul, last year's co-champion has climbed out of his car and behind the wall. Buzz, what put you out? Uh, we ended up, a water pump went on us, but uh, I was happy with where the car was. We seemed to be uh, have pretty good pit position uh, when we came in at the right time. But it's just one of those things you can't control, and that's why it goes. We're seeing a lot of front wing changes. Is the track changing and it's getting cooler a little later? Yeah, we started out with a bunch of unders there, and we came in and ended up, we've done two front wing changes, so it started coming back. And I was happy with where the car was there. You get flat all the way around, you know, and that's all you can do. And, um, yeah, 
so it's kind of frustrating that that happened, but, you know, we'll be back next time. Last year's champ out of it. Paul? You've been watching Eddie Cheever fighting a desperate battle to keep from going two laps down to the leader of the race, Billy Boat. And here is Tony Stewart, now working his way up and with stops in second place. Watch his line here to see if he's still running very low on the racetrack. Tony Stewart has been running right on the yellow line. Now he's a little more comfortable running the middle groove, trying to free the car up a little bit. You can carry more speed if you're a little higher in the groove. Looking for Davey Hamilton. There he is. You get a, a glimpse just for a second there. Uh, Brock back another several hundred yards. And he, of course, is the fourth place car. Robbie Groff is having an awesome race. Dennis McCormick, the team owner, and this whole crew, I mean, they've got to just be pumped with how consistent he's running it. And, I mean, he's got a chance. He's close enough to win this thing, depending on what happens with pit stops and strategy. Uh, and Robbie is one of those that all of the racers said, once you give him a great chance, he's really going to perform, and there's evidence of it. By the way, talking about his brother, Mike, who was injured as we watched Billy Boat in the crash earlier in the week here, suffered some uh, injuries to his legs, and as a result, sent off to Methodist Hospital in Indianapolis. He expects to get out by Monday, and he expects to drive at the next IRL race, which, of course, is the Colorado 200 on Sunday, the 29th of June. But we there will be on ABC Sports. So as you ride with Roberto Guerrero on this uh, dual bank track, the Texas Motor Speedway, the lights are yeah. shining bright now. And the leader becomes Stewart. That's the space now, RG. Well, computers are great, but they're not nearly as good in scoring as Barbara Hellyer, who points out that Billy Boat is still the leader of the race. And... Uh, as the computers are uh, kind of forgetting about Pope for a little bit there and dropping him well down in the order. But we'll go with Barbara for a while. She's been scoring these races for years and years and years. So there in the Consigo car, the number one car. The one, of course, uh, belonging most of the season to Scott Sharp. You heard from him earlier that uh, he hopes to be back in a, in a car in that race in Colorado Springs as well in a couple of weeks but uh, boy Billy Boat has certainly given it a fantastic ride up from its 21st starting position and he's coming low on the racetrack it looks like it's time for him to pit so now we're going to find out if this pit stop will take him out back in front of Stewart or whether it'll drop him off the lead Jerry well Robbie Groff Robbie Groff in for his schedule stop he last pitted on lap 88 that is uh, 45 laps to go. Routine stop, left side, right side tires. Trying to get it completely full of fuel as they still are having trouble now getting the fuel hooked up. The fuel coupling finally going in. That has cost them an extra three or four, five, six, seven seconds as he is down. Billy Boat is into the pits and they are going to work. The four tires have already been changed. I'm waiting to see if they take some out in the front wing. See if his car is uh, acting up loose at all. No, nope. they lost fire in the back of the motor. They have lost fire. This is going to be a cost. Get out of here. And Tony Stewart comes in, Jerry. Tony Stewart scheduled stop, and right behind him, Greg Ray Stewart. Four tire change. They will get it completely full of fuel. Remember, fuel mileage very, very critical. They should be able to make it all the way on one more stop. Davey Hamilton also in front of Alpent Road. Stewart burns out. Let's go down to Marty. And Scott, uh, Davey Hamilton comes in. And Scott Sharp's teammate as well as Billy Boats. And they did make an adjustment in the front wing. He was definitely getting loose. He's back out underway. But Marty, that adjustment was to put more wing in. That's the first time that we've seen that other than Buzz Calkins telling us that in an interview. So in the case of Davey Hamilton, looks like he had some push. They actually put more wing in that car in the front. And he comes out on brand new tires as well. Now we saw, I think, Bolt mounted up a brand new left rear. That shouldn't figure into it that much, but sticker tires for Davey Hamilton. It might actually be a prediction with what they did to the front wing that the things are really pretty good in that car. Well, yeah, but you know, sometimes when you put sticker tires on, and now we have a yellow, Thank yellow you, flag at the start-finish line. Right after these stops, the yellow comes out. Jerry? 
Let me show you the right front tire off Robbie Groff's car. This is the right front, and take a look at uh, apparently starting to see a little bit of blistering here. Now, remember here at this racetrack on some of the ovals, they're using a lot of negative camber, which means they're leaning the top of the tire in like that. And, of course, you get some lateral force when the car goes through the corner, and that causes the bottom of the tire to flex, and that's maybe what's happening with the heat on the racetrack and some adjustments being made. It may be starting to see some tread wear and a little bit of blistering here on the right shoulder of the right front tire. I don't know. Your definition versus mine, Jerry, that, I'd say that's a lot of blistering for me. Robbie tries to push Robbie Buell ahead. The yellow, by the way, is for oil, and uh, they'll get that cleaned up quickly. No contact with the wall, no indication of a blowing engine or a problem. So Buddy Lazier, who has been a key factor during much of this race, slows it down along with the rest of the field. The Indy Racing League, the True Value 500 from the Texas Motor Speedway, being brought to you by Firestone, America's tire since 1900. Well, as the uh, song says, the stars and the moon shine bright in the Texas night deep here in the heart of Texas. The view up overhead and down below, the moon smiles on a gigantic crowd here. Anticipated at over 100,000 strong. We have not heard the final estimate, but boy, they were pouring in here from about noon on, ready to see the IRL race historically for the very first time at night. We'll take a look here at the Aurora Field Summary, which after the stops gives us Buddy Lazier at the top of the field, only car on the lead lap. And then Tony Stewart, who again worked his way up through the field, did battle with Billy Boat, who came up from 21st position. The Foyt cars sit second and fourth right now, so that story of the Texas team continues to work here for us. With A.J. still honchoing both of those cars, keeping track of everything. And there's the rest of the field with those who are out thus far in the run fewer number than I think we would have thought at the 140th lap. Yeah, I think so. And it, it'll be interesting for me to see if Buddy Lazier chooses to pit at the end of this caution period because that is what's put him where he is. And if he does, there's only five cars behind him on that next lap. So he would theoretically only drop to fifth or sixth place if he did come into the pits. Uh, and then he'd have fuel to go to go longer. So we'll have to see if Buddy Lazier decides to to take advantage of this caution period because uh, you definitely do not want to stop here under green. It puts you a long way back. Well, we're very definitely at nighttime now and these cars just sparkle under these lights, Jerry Punch. Paul, let me show you how some of the teams have devised by using the Tuesday and Wednesday night practices to be able to see here when it got late. Now, this is Roberto Guerrero's clear shield I have on the top here. The clear shield is fine. It's very, very good visibility. However, the contrast between looking up in the stands and the light reflections did cause some reflection and some glare. Now, he tried this amber shield, which a lot of people use if you're a, an avid hunter or you shoot a lot at shooting ranges. You know that the amber shield gives you increased visual acuity because it lacks some of the glare and takes away a lot of the transition between high density and low density light. With this amber shield on, he could see with very, very dim light and, of course, the acuity, very, very important. He found that out Tuesday night, as did another, a number of other drivers. That's why many of them have gone from the clear to the amber for night racing. Yeah, the amber also tends to sharpen up the detail for you. You would think that guys like Stewart and Boat have an advantage in this situation because they do this kind of thing so often. That's true, but, you know, Buddy Lazier said that he ran under the lights in Supercross. Obviously, on a motorcycle, uh, it's a much different animal, but he says he is getting used to it, and we're going back to green. Flag green, flag green, green. So now and we've got two cars in trouble right before the start-finish line, down on the dirt. Scott Goodyear looks like to be the one that is going across the grass to his pit hobbling across for a bit there. I assume that's just the bumpiness in the dirt. And he comes in. And the other would have been Tice Carlson because, uh, sure enough, because we know the other car painted like that, Jim Guthrie is out. So, as they were ready to come back green, this happens in the back of the field before the start-finish line, and we're yellow again. Working at the back 
of Scott Goodyear's car in front of the left front. Something caught under there? They're yelling to get him out. They said, I don't care if the car's damaged, leave the pit lane. They do not want to lose a lap. Where's Buddy Lazier? He's up oh. to the left-hand side. Here comes the field. He's got to move now. Nope. Not going to happen. Marty? Well, guys, they have some damage at the left rear, but they don't think it's bad enough to worry about it right now. They wanted to try and get him out. You're right. He's going to go lap down. They could not get the car to refire quickly enough. Oh, so the engine was either shut down or had died as well. The crew trying to get Tyce Carlson going. Oh, that great true value sign in the middle of the field might get a little scuffed up on this one. Here it is, John, way in the back there. It's definitely contact between those two cars. It just looked like people were maneuvering for position and just slight contact with uh, what looked like the right front of Carlson's. Looks like he just hooked around. Yeah, it just looks like Scotty hooked, and then uh, Tice tried to get out of his way. I think prior to that, though, I think they did touch each other. So I, I think that's what got Scott Goodyear spinning. From Scott Goodyear's onboard camera. Remember, he starts out a bit back off of Tice. Oh, Whoa, that was a bump. Oh, yeah. I call that a bump, Jerry Punch. Well, indeed, Tice Carlson just radioed to Paul Dattlevich here in the PDM pits. He said, you know, we try, tried to get out of the way, but he said, I did get bumped. He said, and then he came back and said, but it was an easy bump, but unfortunately, it's a bump that's going to probably put us out as they are now pulling uh, his car across the grass. Now, his pit is directly across from where they're pulling the car, and Dattlevich is trying to signal to get him to pull the car into the pit, so hopefully they can get this thing restarted and maybe have a shot at getting... Uh, Tice Carlson back on the racetrack and indeed they are going to pull the car directly toward us here in the pits and hopefully they'll be able to get Tice back on the track as they have another nose piece coming from the garage. They brought it up for extra wings but apparently the front wings look to be okay. There looks to be minimal damage on the front of the car and now the crew has the car will push it in and will try to get this car refired and get Tice back on the racetrack. And Jerry this comes down to the IRL wanting to have restarts at a little slower pace. And again, like we saw at Indianapolis Motor Speedway, some guys are bringing it up, and then they all get jammed up behind the car as they go green. So they go to work on Tice Carlson's car. They'll try to get Scott Goodyear back in and do more work on that car. The engine died. He went another lap down. Buddy Lazier is still the leader. Car as he gets a drink of cold water, trying to get him back into the action. We've had a number of cars out of the race, but... We also have some who simply have not made it to run here at the Texas Motor Speedway. And it really changes the face of things in the championship fight. Take, for example, Scott Sharp. Now, remember at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, there's his win at Loudoun a year ago. That got him into a co-championship with Buzz Calkins. But then this at Indianapolis during practice where the engine ran all the way down the straightaway. He suffered a head injury. Doctor says Colorado will be his first run. John Paul Jr. almost head on into the wall. Again, Indy and practice. Fractures to the legs. It'll be several more weeks before John Paul Jr. is able to drive a car again. We wish him well. <laughs> Jeff Ward had that spectacular run at the Indy 500. The former motocross champion who looked so very good leading the race at Indy and uh, finishing up in third place. And he's waiting for a ride from Team Cheever. And then Mike Groff, the points leader, who was practicing here earlier in the week, spun, got it into the wall, again, suffered some fractures, and we're hoping that he is back into action soon. But what that's going to do to the points, now here's the way they stand coming into the race. Obviously, Mike Groff is going to lose that points championship before the day is over. And the way they stand right now, giving the positions at this moment, Hamilton picks up the lead, followed by Stewart and Calkins. Mike Groff drops down to fourth place. Jerry Punch? We might want to update, update Mike Groff's situation. You know, I talked to Sue Groff, Mike's mom, and, of course, I've been talking to Robbie, his brother, in the mornings at breakfast at that same hotel. We were just trying to keep following what was going on with Mike. 
He suffered uh, a fracture, a spiral fracture of the left tibia. That's the weight-bearing bone between the knee and the ankle in the left leg. Also a small puncture wound at about the knee on the outside, about the size of a quarter. He was flown to Indianapolis, had surgery, had screws put in to fix the tibia. The good news is we are being told he may be released or discharged as early as tomorrow. He will fly back to California, and we are told he will miss the Pikes Peak race uh, at the end of June. That's June 29th, but could be back as early as the July 26th event at Charlotte Motor Speedway. Now, also updating John Paul Jr., who was injured at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. He had his cast reduced to a knee cast. I'm told in a week he'll have that cast changed to a carbon fiber cast, and he could be carried to the car, we're told. He still can't bear weight, but he might be able to start the Pikes Peak race coming up at the end of June. Well, here is a good number for you. We were looking for something official. Bruton Smith, it's his track. 128,000 people in here tonight. I'll tell you what, biggest crowd in Texas right now. Texas Motor Speedway, the IRL, is ready to go back to green flag racing. It'll be Buddy Lazier that leads this green, race. Green, green, green. As the green comes out, here we go again. Do they get through safely? Yes, they do, but there's some movement there at the back. But again, Buddy Lazier does not seem to be able to get up to speed. That was not a pass for a position, but he lost a spot there because that car just does not seem to come up to speed. Maybe he has much different gearing, and now he's running back to the front. So Spiri on the outside. And so Spiri grabs the lap back and then loses it again. Maybe he intentionally has just said it with some tall gears. Here comes Tony Stewart. He's on the charge. Now he's being shown by all the scoring as a lap down. But I got to tell you, some of the spotters and certainly scorers here are not entirely sure of his positioning on the track. Uh, he may actually be up on the lead lap. We're asking for some confirmation of that. As he goes wheel to wheel with Sosperi, pushes him up the track and now sets his sights on Buddy Lazier. Well, that was a big time pucker factor for uh, Sosperi there. He didn't realize that it was going to be so close to Stewart. He jumped right up the racetrack. But these guys do seem to stick well. Lying up now, the red, white, and blue car trying to also get by Sosperi. Vincenzo Sosperi with a very tall learning curve. Remember, he took his first flying start in years at the Indianapolis 500, and during the race, took his first pit stop ever. So I think given that, he's showing pretty well here. He definitely has. We see down there, uh, the, uh, Tice Carlson coming back and joining the action, but he's lost, obviously, multiple laps getting that car fixed. Tony Stewart now, the way he's running, he's acting like he wants to get a lap back. Back scoring showing him a lap down. He looks to get on the lead lap. Moves to the outside of Buddy Lazier. They come side by side off the corner, back in the corner. Side by side. Boy, look at this action. As the two of them continue to battle out. Onto the back stretch. Oh, what a run this is. Buddy Lazier still gonna hold him on. They're gonna try and do a complete lap side by side. They're giving each other room. That's the good sign. They're not unwinding the wheel all the way to the wall. Stewart trying it again. If there was a question, could the IRL turn this race side by side here? There's your answer. Look at that. Now going for their second lap side by side. When you run on the outside, you actually have a faster speed through the corner, but the guy in the bottom actually travels on a shorter route. Last time around at 213 side by side for both. This is great stuff. Just a tick, a couple of times. Oh, look at that. And finally, Stewart resolves it, but Buddy Lazier isn't going to give it up. I wonder if Buddy Lazier is thinking what some other people are. Just hoping that every scoring computer is showing right and that Stewart just got back on the lead lap and not taking the lead. Jerry Punch? Larry Curry told Tony, you're a lap down. You're a lap down. You have got to get by. When they were side by side, Stewart started screaming, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. And he screamed for an entire lap and a half until he made the pass. Now, oh, Buddy Lazier now pulls off the fight, heads for Pitt Road. What a spectacular run they showed for several laps there. Three of them actually running side by side. But Buddy seems to be going slower. I know that 80 miles per hour is obviously seems so much slower. But it didn't really seem as though he approached that. Is he broken, Marty? 
Yeah, yeah, we just talked to Ron Hemmelgarn. The motor let go, and he is coasting into the pits. This race is over, guys. And you saw a puff of smoke, a little flame at the last minute there. So Tony Stewart ran him down and ran him into the ground. So now that gives the lead of the race to Tony Stewart. There he is, the two car, the Glidden car. He picks up the lead because he was running in second a lap down. And Buddy Lazier, with a valiant effort, now is forced to climb from the Delta Fawcett car. the yellow his teammate Tony Stewart is the leader and we expect all of the leaders into the pit shortly Jerry and Tony Stewart is coming in right now Paul they said watch your speed watch your speed 80 miles an hour under caution this should be the final scheduled stop 2 1 and 30 you're watching the pit stop of course uh, Tony Stewart crew routine pit stop Robbie Groff further up pit road Stop for Billy Boat, 11.9. He's back underway. This is their last stop. 14.6 on the 30 car, not nearly as good. Oh, and gives it a little pitch as he comes out as well. So there are the stops with the A.J. Foyt team really doing a number for Billy Boat. And I assume that takes them to the end. Oh, yeah. They will be able to get to the end easily here. They will not have to save any fuel. We'll be able to see who has the fastest car. You know, it's kind of a bonus for Groff at a 14.6. Uh, that's not that big of a deal under yellow because obviously he'll be able to close that down. And again, it's now going to be up to Robbie. And they've lost a slight bit of time in the pits, but this is just perfect scenario for them to having a chance to pit under yellow. When they go green, they're going to give Vincenzo Sosperi the black flag and call him in. He broke the speed limit in the pits, the speed limit tonight, 80 miles an hour at the Texas Motor Speedway. So we should see them go back green very shortly. Again, this yellow period as a result of the engine letting go on Robbie Buell's car. And that has to ask questions. What is the story on Tony Stewart's engine? First time we've really seen Menard have this kind of trouble. Five hundred K, three hundred and twelve miles. The stop should be done for everyone. We should be set to go green, and Billy Boat will be lined up right behind Tony Stewart. Should be a sprint oh. run, and wow! Look at him dodge to miss a slower car as they come back. Tyson Carlson wasn't getting up to speed there, and my, that was a close moment. They come up to speed off of turn two. Billy Boat, Tony Stewart, they begin a battle now. Who have similar backgrounds. Lion Dyke got down below the yellow line there, got in trouble. Lion Dyke is trying to get a lap back here. These two guys, the white and yellow car of Stewart right behind Billy Boat, that's for the lead. So Sperry pulls aside to let the battle for the lead come on through. He's not a factor in this fight right now. Robbie Groff sits in third, Davey Hamilton sits in fourth. Battle for the lead goes down the back stretch. Now, if I was Billy Boat, I would want to get in there, and I would really want to push on Stewart to see if I could get him to blow up like we saw with Robbie Buell. Remember, they could run fifth or sixth gear, and if Stewart feels comfortable, he'll stick it. Oh, oh no. no! Robbie Croft. Smoke at the back of the 30, Team Losi Alpha Laval car, and it looks like it's over. What a great ride he gave that car, though. They can be proud of this one. They can be proud. Robbie can be proud. Uh, you know... That's the first thing you have to do as a rookie coming in is show your speed, and then as the equipment gets better, obviously you hope that doesn't happen. Jerry Punch. Well, now Robbie Buell becomes a spectator and a cheerleader. He's been cheering and clapping each time Tony Stewart came by. Robbie, you gave it a whale of a run. What happened? Um, we just picked up a little bit of a miss in the motor, and then obviously it started smoking, but up to that point, I mean, the car was great. I knew we had a good car yesterday, and it just got better and better as the race went on, and the whole crew did an excellent job. Any warning at all? You said it was missing a little bit. Did you know it was going to go when it went? Yeah. Uh, the car picked up a, a little bit of a noise, probably 10 laps prior. We weren't seeing the OPM, and then she let go. Or, yeah, I don't even think it let go. I think just something broke. Ordinarily, a driver goes to the garage area, but you don't want to miss this finish. Well, 
Tony's running a good race. My car was only getting better. Unfortunately, I think this could have been a one-two finish for us. All right, Robbie Buell now out of it, but gets to cheer on his teammate, maybe to his first win of the year. Well, Tony Stewart certainly has tried enough as again you look at the tire manufacturers and again with the Lion Dyke presence coming back toward the front of the field. Firestone uh, continues to lead but breaks in to an advantage held by Goodyear for a while there. Still pretty even across the start, the, the entire group of the front order here. Let's take a look at that restart coming out of the last yellow one more time and all the weaving and bobbing that went on there. Very close, obviously, between Stewart and Boat. That was Tice Carlson, who we know has been into the pits for repairs. He didn't get up to speed, and that was a slow-mo replay. In, in real time, that thing was, was closer than it looks. So Tony Stewart looking at perhaps his first victory. Well, there are two A.J. Foyt cars behind him who would like to contest that possibility, and you can't discount the fact that A.J. is here, he's got a lot of friends in the crowd, it's not all that far from his home, it's very important for him to do very well here, so, you know he's going to pull out all the stuff, probably drop out so early, Jerry Hunt. Well, Paul, from 21st tonight, to Andy from 13th in the lead here, Robbie, what an effort. Well, it was fun while it lasted, and the car was great, and, uh, I tell you, brain engineering has always given us a great engine. Nothing's changed. You know, you think you're immune to some of the, you know, the new engine problems here with IRL. And, you know, tonight, unfortunately, it bit us. But the McCormick Motorsport, Alpha Lavelle Team Lose car was great up until the time the engine expired. So what can you say? You know, I drove 100%. The guys did 100% for those things. You had to have a big cheerleader watching from a hospital bed back in Indiana. Yeah, that's right, Mike. I miss you, and uh, can't wait to come back. He really wanted to win this one for Mike. At least have a good finish, but it's over here with just a few laps to go. Paul. Well, Tony Stewart's handling them all up now in his Glidden number two car. John Menard's entry into this race. His teammate, of course, the Quaker State car, Robbie Buell, is out of the run. Now, what we're going to do is look back through the field for you, and we'll look for Billy Boat, who's right there, the blue and white car. And we're looking for Hamilton. Baby Hamilton, the orange and white number 14, and there he comes. So that's first, second, third. Ari Leyendijk is a lap off the pace in the number five car, the Sprint PCS car, trying to find a way back onto the lead lap so that he can join this car. Davey Hamilton, sponsored by Power Team, which is actually a wholesale distributor of electricity, which I think they're using a lot of electricity tonight on these lights, Paul. I'll tell you what, it is a beautiful setting. Watching these cars run at night has been a wonderful experience, especially when you see stuff like you just saw there. As he feathered out of the throttle a little bit, you can see the bright blue flames of the exhaust because it's obviously a bit dimmer. We ride with Scott Goodyear. The other half of that Treadway team trying to work his way back into the fight as well. But Tony Stewart is our leader in the 500K here, 312 miles. But A.J. Boyd's team is on the attack. Sorry, Leyendijk and his desire to get into the fight before he can do that. He's got to get around Tony Stewart and get back on the leader lap. But he's pulled up behind Stewart and has given it a go. Remember, there's no love lost between these two guys. The bickering started in Indianapolis. You're looking at the youngest driver in the field and the oldest driver in the field, Ari Lyons. The most experienced, the youngest guy, of course, Tony Stewart. Tony right now is just trying to worry about winning the race. Will he try and hold up Lyons, or will he just move over and let him go? Ari Lyons poured another million and a half into his coffers as a result of the uh, win at Indy. Now he wants to attack this guy. Remember, at Indy, there he goes down to the inside. Stewart gave him the room to go there, but remember at Indy when it was so close down the back stretch? And Lion Dyke, for an incredible distance, had two wheels on the grass. Now, in that particular case, Stewart was also working a slower car. Maybe he didn't have to get him that far over, but it certainly added a little fuel to an already existing fire between these two. Jerry? 
Well, that pass a moment ago was by design. The last four or five laps, Larry Curry has been telling his young driver, Tony, you have to stay in fourth gear. After seeing what happened to Buell, him going up in smoke, they wanted to stay in fourth gear as opposed to fifth and sixth. And Jan, I got a question. How many RPMs will they save by running it down in the cruise gear? Well, Jerry, that's a very interesting call because you would expect them to say run in sixth gear because generally what they do is they put the tallest gear in sixth, then a, a faster gear in, in fifth, and then maybe a traffic gear in fourth. So unless they've got a code worked out on the radio, uh, you would think they want it to be in the top gear so the engine turns uh, RPM, let's say, 9,500 or something, so they don't have the same problem as fuel. Interesting call. I wonder if, wonder if code isn't the key to that. Well, you know, you could actually, this is not a sequential gearbox. I guess you could put you could the gears put anything you want there, in whatever you? pattern you want. You could just stick it anywhere. So maybe they decided to put their, their cruiser gear in fourth. <laughs> that, of course, is one of the things that you can do with this gearbox. I just want to think that out a second further. You wouldn't think that you would want to do it. It's an H pattern box, not sequential. And you, you think it would be prone to mistakes proper order there unless they're all very close well they are all close. i mean a lot of times they're only 150 rpm apart yeah but generally if you're going to start the race you're used to going in that h pattern you're not used to going in a different order so uh the one thing we know for sure is that they do not want him to turn more rpm than he has to they don't want this thing to blow up like it did on view right that's that's the key point they have a concern now for the leader of the race we haven't heard that kind of thing. Look at this. Scott Goodyear. Now, that just to try to work himself to get back into the fight. He's running down about seventh place right now, trying to get back on the lead lap as well. So that's the, the key for a lot of these guys. Billy Boat, again, very wisely said, no, I'm not going to fight with that. That's, uh, that's not a battle I need to get into. And we will watch now to see how the tactics play out for A.J. Foyt as he commands Billy Boat and Davey Hamilton, the second and third place cars, and tries to get them up in contact with Tony Stewart, the leader. What you're seeing is you're seeing two different types of strategies. You're seeing guys that need to get their laps back, and they're going all out when they're running in, let's say, fifth or maybe even fourth gear. And then you have guys that are up on the front. Obviously, they're trying to save their cars and make it to the end. On board, on board with Roberto Guerrero as we are. You can hear him, the spotters telling him exactly where the cars are around it. And we are beginning to move into the final laps of this run. Will Tony Stewart finally put it into winner's circle in the IRL? Laps are all done. We move to the final 10 laps of the True Value 500K at Texas Motor Speedway. It's been an interesting run, somewhat disjointed. A lot of action at the track here. Some engines being the cause of some frustration for a number of the teams, most notably Team Lennart, who had Robbie Buell's engine let go just a few laps ago. And so that sets up the True Value field summary at this moment with the two Foyt cars trying to catch Stewart. Billy Boat being the one who perhaps can. But he is right now well off of Stewart. The real question is, can Tony Stewart's engine make it to the end of this run? The Glidden car is Stewart. He has led all but one race in the IRL. There he goes under Johnny Unser, who is replacing Mike Groff in the car and it looks like he is doing exactly as instructed don't be crazy you don't have to show me anything except get it into the top 10. jonathan bird the owner of the car was very clear on that and unser is sitting at eighth right now and of course johnny wants to just bring this car home as well he has one of the only three nissan infinity engines that were entered in this race and his best career finish in the irl is a ninth so he's hoping to maybe better that today. Well, Billy Boat is the key as we watch for him looking at Goodyear there. Goodyear, you can see running down seventh place. Unser actually in ninth. 
So in a tie for his his best ever position, but there's there's some room for movement here yet. John Menard hands on hips. Watching as we count down into the final lap. Five to go now. This is a nerve-wracking time for an owner. At least a driver is out there standing on the pedal. Uh, nothing an owner can do right now but just pace. You know, it's it's old, it's trite. We've all said it at least once about a driver at this point in the race hearing everything. But you know, a couple times recently I've just heard exactly that as they climb out of the car. Most notably, Jim Guthrie at Phoenix said in those final laps, he could hear the wheel bearings scraping against each other. He could hear every cylinder going. You wonder if that's not what Tony Stewart's feeling right now, too. He's seen Robbie Buell's car go. He knows what happened there. He's heard the orders of his team. He knows victory is within sight with three to go. But still, he has to wonder and wonder and wonder. Did the one car just slow a bit? Let's watch his line through three and four. He looks up to speed at this point. It may have been balked just a little bit in traffic. Tony Stewart certainly at, at this moment looks like he's he's on. Oh, oh and there oh, is exactly what they worry about. Stewart, the engine lets go. He catches the wall. Billy Boat will take the lead. But Billy has to get by him yet. Unbelievable. Just exactly what we feared. Tony Stewart cannot make it to the finish. The engine, despite every effort to save it, let's go. John Menard has to be struck. Marty? Do you think that you will ever get a break in this? I don't, it doesn't seem that way, does it? It just seems like uh, we're so close, and every time we get closer, right now I'm just worried if Tony's okay, and you know, Darn it, I just, uh, I don't know what to tell you. Well, Marty, you can tell him he appears okay. We can tell you, they're telling us up in the booth, he appears to be okay, so that's good news. Good, good. Um, Tony just ran a wonderful race. Uh, you know, we're so close, we get so close, and uh, I don't know, you know, one of these days we're going to make it all the way, but uh, just a few laps. Three laps I'm just from glad the that uh, he's okay. I, you know, that's all I care about. <laughs> Uh, unable to, I can't believe you can get a smile on your face, John. So, John Menard's team, they do bring out a stretcher for, uh, for Tony Stewart. We'll keep track of that, but he appeared to be moving in the car and actually talking to the rescuers. Uh, well, they get him out and lay him down. Uh, obviously, he's moving and he <laughs> doesn't seem like he wants to lay down. And Billy Boat driving for A.J. Foyt will come around and see the white and yellow flags together. Davey Hamilton will sit in second place, and A.J. Foyt, in front of the Texas crowd, is going to go to a 1-2 finish in just a mile and a half. Unbelievable. Who would have thought? I mean, Tony Stewart was just cruising around. Here he is. He's in whatever gear it is. He's trying to save the RPM. He knows his teammate had trouble. Across the finish line, I mean, Paul, you said you hear things in the engine, you hear things in the car. I mean, he heard something here, and it was real. And that was the last thing that he wanted to hear. And unfortunately, right here, oil he's got oil on the, on the tires, and yeah. he's just a passenger here, and nothing you can do. Not super heavy contact, but remember, you're still going 200 miles an hour here. It's still a pretty big hit. So Tony Stewart out. He'll have to make a trip to the uh, medical center here, and get the clearance of the positions and now the uh, John Menard reaction at exactly that moment as he watched his car uh, I think we know what he said there oh but how sad for them oh, yeah. how terribly sad and it was predicted so now look at this he's gonna do it AJ Floyd is gonna finish first and second with Billy Boat and Davey Hamilton, they make the turn off the final corner. They come to the line, and the tear of the West Coast Midgets has taken the win here in the True Value 500. His teammate, Davey Hamilton, will finish in second. What a run that was. Marty? <laughs> well, well, 300 tickets. It must have been worth it, huh? It's great. And I'll tell you what, we named that car Christine. She hurt three other drivers and is finally glad to just see her do something. Did, did you ever think 
that it was going to come down like this? Well, we were pushing the front end. I told him back off and just hang on for a second. We weren't trying to trophy dash. We're just thrilled to death. The whole crew deserves this very much. This guy wants to get to victory lane, guys. I can't blame him. And you know, he's right. That crew, I mean, they built, what, three cars up from the ground virtually in, in 48 hours at Indianapolis. They had the problem with Scott Sharp. <laughs> Sparky flags the race off as well here, part of the showmanship. And Stewart's car sits broken, shattered at the edge of the race course. It carried him to within three miles of victory this time. But still not far enough. Billy Boat, the Conseco car, is the winner. I wonder what that's going to do now for team organization hereafter. I mean, that's a spectacular win. Does A.J. Uh, keep Billy in the fold there, field another car for Scott? He certainly has them within the stable. That's a question, obviously, uh, A.J. will answer. He has quite a few cars, but I'll tell you, this team, as you said, Paul, has worked so, so hard to put these cars together after just such a tough month in India. Unofficial results as Billy Bo runs from 21st up to the lead and takes the win in the last three laps when Tony Stewart's engine lets go. Followed by his teammate, Davey Hamilton, the Indy winner, Ari Leyendijk, unofficially in third. Stewart, though, able to pull out a fourth place finish unofficially. We'll wait for some auditing on this, but this is the way it looks right now, uh, even with that crash. And then Heliseo Salazar, we look down through the entire field. A lot of cars out on this one. 500 kilometers, 312 miles. Good distance for racing. I really like to see things run at about 300 miles. That's, that's a nice distance. Into the winner's circle, A.J. Foyt being welcomed by the Texas crowd. And here it comes. Billy Boat with a great team that through all of their adversity kept a great, great sense of humor. Always had a glad hand and a nice wave for everybody. Now Jerry Punch is there and ready to move in. Well, fireworks are exploding, confetti in victory lane, and we have just been told unofficially the crowd tonight, 128,500 Texans saw Super Tex A.J. Foyt's cars finish first and second, and now the big guy, A.J., gives Billy Boat a huge hug. Billy, congratulations. This has to be a dream come true. Yeah, after being last, I was just thinking, no, I just like the... I just know I had to take the Foyk and Seco car, be steady. I know I had a good race car. You know, you, you gotta you, to finish first. You gotta finish, and uh, we did that today. It was just a great victory for this whole team. They really deserve it. Christine didn't let us down today. She didn't let you down today. Three weeks ago, you didn't have a ride. AJ made you a call at Indianapolis. You got a top ten finish there, and then a, a storybook finish. What about a promise you made? The pit stop in qualifying, you told the crew, I'll make up for it. Oh, yeah, I told them, you know, after I screwed up qualifying, I said, don't worry, I'll make it up to you in the race. And uh, I didn't really, you know, I knew we, I knew we had a good team, but uh, to win this is just fantastic. Feels great. The track all night long didn't change a whole lot. What were your thoughts when you saw the smoke, or did you see the smoke on Tony Stewart's car? Did they tell you on the radio? I never saw the smoke. I just saw the yellow, and AJ got on the radio and said, Tony blew up. You know, I was wanting to, we, we had it in a kind of a cruise gear there at the end. And I said, AJ, let me put in fifth, let me put in fifth to try to bring the RPM up to catch him. And he said, no, take it easy, you're doing fine. So I left in sixth, and uh, here we are. How will you celebrate? Uh, I don't know, just spend some time with my wife and go home and spend some, some time with my, with my kids. Say hi to them at home. So choked with emotion. Billy Boat from Phoenix, Arizona. Wife Andrea sitting home with three kids watching probably the biggest moment, undoubtedly the biggest moment in this young man's career. But most of all, what a day for the grand champion, A.J. Foyt. His car has finished first and second in front of this gigantic crowd at the Texas Motor Speedway. There were 13 cars running at the finish. And so in the IRL battle, the points fight now. Mike Groff came in leading, but Davey Hamilton 
the other Foyt driver, leads the points. Tony Stewart just nine back. Calkins, Mike Grump, he still could get in there. Next stop for the IRL, of course, is the Pikes Peak International Speedway on the 29th of this month, the Colorado 200. Don't forget tomorrow, we've got plenty of coverage on racing from this race, as well as NASCAR today. Carts on the grid, part on ABC with the Detroit Grand Prix, and then a wrap of all of it on RPM tonight. Uh, coming up next, they at the races. And Tony Stewart fails with just three to go. Billy Boat drives a very smart race and takes the win for A.J. Foyt, followed by his teammate, Davey Hamilton. A great day in front of a gigantic crowd at the Texas Motor Speedway. They love what they saw here tonight. There's still many of them standing in their seats. I'm Paul Page. Thanks for joining us.